virtual machine and I have almost less than an hour, but let, let, let's finish it. Okay, so for now, so we'll be discussing about we'll be discussing about the kernel tricks. We introduced that yes uh, in the last class, and we talked about this. This is called the uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, this is actually you, you, we build up the story uh, on support vector machine optimization, and it is looking for finding the decision boundary, which is w x plus b equals zero, right? And it has a uh, positive side of the line, and it has a negative side of the line, right? Actually, in, be in between, uh, this is the line. This is called the decision boundary. But this is w x plus b equals plus one. I mean, I could have said I'll do plus one. And here, in the bottom line is minus one. They, they, all these three lines are parallel. And we, we saw actually support vector machines optimization goal is to maximize these distance, right? Perpendicular distance. And we call these distance margin. And we, we, we discussed that, and this is the formula that we, we found that we, if we actually, the margin formula is, if I use a different color, so the total margin, so let's do that here. So the margin, the formula is uh, two over, this right we, we we proved that uh i mean we we derived that using our plain old geometry but anyway so that means if we need to maximize this margin we need to minimize the denominator right and this is how the story begins right we need to minimize the function which is this and if we can minimize that uh definitely the denominator is going to be the minimum and that means the margin is going to be maximum. So that is the holy grail of this objective function. And uh, we saw this condition for all the positive samples. This should be true. And all the negative samples, this should be true. OK, so and uh, finally, we introduce, uh, since there are two functions, and this is a constraint of opti optimization, uh, meaning that you have an objective function. You really have some constraint that you need to be satisfied. So you can merge these two. Uh, uh, together introducing these Lagrangian multipliers and that's it. Uh, so it becomes, so this is, this is called the primal form of uh, the support vector machine. And uh, we tried to, we attempted to solve this using the gradient descent, I mean, uh, finding the gradient and then, because there are two, three parameters. Uh, we, we can initiate, actually initiate uh, derived, um, getting the gradient of the Lagrangian function with respect to W, and we we end up having an interesting, uh, what is it, uh, formulation, interesting equation. So knowing the alpha, which are the Lagrangian multipliers, x i and y i, everything is known, right? Because this is coming with the data, right? X i is what is x i? X i is the data set, right? I mean, if I uh, add a new page. So x uh, x i is some dimensional data set, right? Uh, say x say x i one, or maybe we, we write it this way. So say, okay. So your data set is like this, right? So this is y, and these are x. Uh, I one, X I two, X I so on and so forth, right? You have say it's an n-dimensional data set, right? So X I n. So we, I'm talking about this, right? So these particular vector, so having n elements, this is your X I. So that means this is a vector that represents, the, that denotes uh, your input variable, and this is the corresponding yi. Right? So say this is this is plus one, this is minus one, so on and so forth. And alpha, this is another uh, another how to say uh, the value, right? 
which is we, which needs to be solved. But anyway, so uh, if we if we know alpha, we know w. Okay, and uh, since we don't know alpha, we cannot uh, can, can you cannot solve this, right? We'll we'll solve. Usually we, we try to solve alpha, but yeah, it's it's gonna be difficult. But anyway, so uh, if you take a derivative with respect to b, and you get this interesting equation. I mentioned about that the conservation law, conservation principle of uh, uh, the weight, uh, the targets. Right. This is a weighted sum of all the uh, ground truth. Right. Okay. So always remember these two, and this is very important. In uh, I've, I've talked about this, and from the primal objective function, uh, if we plug these two properties that we just derived, the W equals this and uh, the conservation principle. <laughs> uh, plug this in here, and you get this beautiful uh, objective function that only has alpha as an unknown parameter. Previously, we had three unknown, W, B, and alpha. Right now, it becomes a single unknown objective function, which is very easy to solve. Uh, so. And here you see that this is, I've mentioned about that uh, before, this is a dot product between these two vectors. Xi is the ith data, uh, ith sample, having say n variables. Xj is the zth sample, uh, uh, having n variables. And we, we mentioned about that, that Xi, it can be written as Xi transpose Xj. It can also be written as Xi comma xj uh, as this angle brackets. These are all means the same. These are inner product. I've, I've talked about that before. Inner product, dot product, whichever you want to talk, right? So always remember this. Uh, this is a dot product notation. Okay, so this is not a multiplication. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, definitely it's a matrix multiplication, but anyway, so this is dealing with vectors, okay? Uh, and subject to these, which already uh, we have derived. And knowing alpha, we can solve W. We, we talked about that. And if we know W and we can definitely solve B as well, uh, we plug these into this equation. So given a new data sample, we plug these into this equation and we check the sign. If the sign is positive, it, it, it falls into the, how to say, the, uh, the positive plus, uh, otherwise it's negative. Okay, and this is the interesting part here. So I've, I've talked about actually a couple of illustrations, visual illustrations to, to try to motivate you that if the data doesn't seem to be uh, linearly separable, I mean, we can, uh, then we need to transform the data set into higher dimension. Uh, we try to motivate, so you remember that a uh, couple of examples that if we just add one of the new, uh, how to say, uh, it's a quadratic function of the, the input variable, the x and then x square, uh, you see that the, uh, the data set becomes, I mean, easily linearly separable. And then you apply support vector machine and it's, it's gonna find that straight line or the plane. Um, so, it's, uh, so it is uh, one of the Asians that, uh, the data, most of the data might not be linearly separable in the original dimensionality. If we raise it to higher dimension, might be. So this is the ingredient in support vector machine. So th say this is a two dimensional data set and we're using a transformation function. And we need to uh, say, this is a one particular example. Uh, say we're, I mean, increasing, I mean, we're changing this 2D into three-dimensional data by this one, using this function, x1 square, x2 square, square root of two, x1 and x2, right. Uh, then, uh, remember in the, in the dual problem, everything is known. I mean, uh, so this is a function, alpha, that you need to solve because you're optimizing this. Uh, yi, yj is known, right? And xi and xj, the inner product, xi transpose and xj. So there is an inner product between a, a pair, right? A pair of data sample. 
So now let's see uh, how these pair. So given two data samples, x and j, z, I mean, x equals the x1, x2, uh, and z equals z1, z2. You have two data points. Then now you need you just transform it. So the, using this transformation function, each individual data point, right? These two will become a three-dimensional data set, right? So the first data, since this is an inner product between these two pair, so this is the first pair, and this is the second, since you're using transpose, so a column vector is gonna become a row vector, and this remains in the column vector. And then you do matrix multiplication, right? And you can do that. This is the matrix multiplication result, and since here you can see you can use algebra uh, to get x1, z1 plus x2, z2, whole square, right? And uh, essentially this is, this particular thing is, yeah, I mean, this is essentially x transpose z, right? I mean, if you, uh, if you take an inner product between these two, you will get this expression inside the expression. So that means uh, x transpose z square, right? So meaning that, so if the transformation function, so say this is the transformation function, okay? So x and z. So the transformation function being, uh, okay? So the function, so function k, x and z. So if it is this, uh, x transpose, z whole square, uh, we can replace this part by that part in here, right? So that is the point. I mean, say, we, we can actually, uh, support vector machine, uh, so this is the dual problem of the support vector machine, right? I mean, that means we need to optimize these objective function, uh, that gets you the alpha that maximizes this quantity, right? And here you see that pairwise, I mean, this ij pair. So that means all pair uh, in a product between these two original data points, right? And uh, we we are right now motivated that original data dimension, so xi, the originally uh, might not be, I mean, the, the entire data set, all the data samples, are, might not be linearly separable. So what we need to do, we need to transform this data set, right? So we need to change these xi into uh, higher dimension. So that means we need to change this xi and we need to change this, change this xj, right? And we, we take an inner product between that. So that is the whole idea, right? But changing all the data samples so maybe you have a thousand data samples, right? Uh, if we need to do that, uh, there's gonna be a lot of work. That means you need to, you need to create a new data set, uh, even higher dimension. That means your data storage memory requirements is gonna be higher, right? So uh, instead of doing that, if we find a quantity or a property that can calculate this, uh, thing, the inner product between these two, if we can find a function, a plain function like this, that is a function of the original data set, uh, that should be, I mean, simpler. You don't need to create new data set uh, just to uh, introduce higher dimensionality uh, to get a linearly separable plane, right? Uh, linearly separable hyperplane. So there is a term hyperplane because uh, you know that if it is a single dimension, I mean, uh, if it is a, I mean, Wx plus b, remember this, Wx plus b. Uh, if it is a single dimension, definitely this is a line equation, right? If it is a two, dim two dimension, if x is, if x is two dimensional, then it becomes planar, right? If it is three dimensional, then what? Still, that's a plan, and we call it hyperplane to introduce that. Yeah, this is a general line equation, right? Uh, so more than two dimensional plan, which whichever it is, we call it uh, plan. 
anyway so that's the po point that means uh, introducing functions uh, of the original data dimensionality we're essentially achieving the same thing we are still working on the higher dimension so that is the trick kernel trick and that support vector machine so if you replace this part uh, with a kernel function uh, and kernel function definitely is a function that does this type of transformation there is some predefined uh, functions but anyway so uh, and you know this is going to be sticking with you for a long time because this is one of the beautiful function here uh, okay so i mean i'm sorry this one this one is the first kernel function to you instead of doing that uh, instead of working on the original data dimensionality, you need to pull up, get into a high dimensionality like this. And once you are there, uh, and you don't need to change in each individual data dimensionality to high dimension, into the, using only, so the replacing this inner product by that kernel function, uh, you're doing the same thing. That means your objective function is going to be working on the same data dimension. Right. Okay, so there's the main thing. So there's the whole, uh, the, there's the component driving force behind uh, uh, support vector machines. And it, it is this one of the strength of support vector machine is, is this. Instead of working on, so this is essentially uh, the same as uh, replacing Okay, so replacing this with the kernel function because they're same, same, right? So that's it, that's it to you. So now think about what might be the kernel functions. I mean, uh, there's a choice and this is not a uh, learnable parameter. I mean, uh, this is not part of the, how to say, you're not learning what kernel function you're gonna use, right? You need to define before you apply support recommendation, you need to ask actually, what is the kernel function that is uh, gonna, do the trick and you know you saw one of the kernel function already right uh, which is uh, x transpose so xi transpose xj square right so this is your first kernel function uh, xi xj equals this this is your first kernel function to you it, it, it transformed the data into uh, three dimension right uh, Okay, so uh, oh, yeah. so it, it it increases the data into, uh, I mean, it, it increases by one dimension. But anyway, so this is the objective function. Uh, so now this is the dual problem. And once you know this, uh, this is a repeated slide. But anyway, so previously we saw that uh, while, so after the training, uh, you solve your W and you solve your B and given a new data set what you need to do you need to definitely apply kernel here so this is the function so w is now become this right uh so w u so i mean so let, let's go slow so here you have the equation this is coming from that property that we derived earlier uh now we're so so w is learned say after you do optimization you get your w and b as well because g is also the same question it is a coefficient but anyway so w and b are going to be solved and once w and b are solved you need to use that so that's part of the model right i mean you use this model to test uh i mean test uh, a new data sample so a new data sample comes in say so xi uh oh, u is the is the new data sample u is a vector having a same number, n number of variables. Then uh, what you need to do, you need to transform U as well, right? You worked on, uh, although subordination didn't uh, want to or force you to transform each individual training samples into high dimensional space, but it worked on high dimension and get the result uh, that is that makes the data set linearly separable. So, uh, so you, you replace these into, so this is the equation that we previously uh, saw and we replace this part here 
And if you plug these in here, you get this, right? So, uh, so let, let's, let's go slow here. So here, so fx equals w, which is uh, I one to, you have m number of samples. This is alpha i, yi, uh, xi, right, xi. And you have, you, you need to multiply that with, so this is another vector, which is u, right? So this is the new data sample, right? And you need to take an inner product between them, right? So this is a dot because this is a vector and this is a vector. So you need to calculate the inner product between this plus B, right? And once you do, then problem solved, right? So since you worked on using, you know, maybe your supervisor machine uh, was trained using a specific kernel function, right? Uh, so, but here XI is the original data, data dimension and U is in the original space. During testing, do you need to work on low dimension? Because your model is trained on high dimension, right? Uh, so here, you need to transform these two again. I mean, so you need to transform xi uh, inner product u, right? Uh, so yi alpha i one to m. So you need to pull these data dimensionality and, and you saw that you didn't need to change uh, these manually, right? The kernel function that you used applies here as well. So K, Xi, and U, that's it. So this is what happened here. So if you know the kernel function that you're using, you just apply it here, pass the U through this, and you're done. And once you get the result from here, uh, you just, check the sign of this value, I mean, of this function. If it is positive, uh, go predict it as positive sample. If it is negative, go predict it as a negative sample. That's it, that's, that's simple, uh, as it said. So a uh, couple of kernels that I should, it's too deep, you can form it. Okay, so first kernel function is this. This is, actually, I mean, the simplest kernel, which is which does nothing. I mean, it works with the original data dimension, which you saw that in the original dual problem, uh, there were at the very end you saw xi dot inner product xj, right? That's it. I mean, uh, that's the identity kernel, right? I mean, it it does not it doesn't change any uh, dimensionalities uh, on on the data set. So this is the polynomial kernel. So the second kernel you know, is one of the thing that you saw as a kernel trick here. It is a, this is like this. So X transpose Y, I mean, inner product between these two plus one to the P, okay. Uh, so here, I mean, you, 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 can, uh, you can consider this that uh, this is one of the, so see, P value should be greater than one, then it's polynomial because if P starts from two, then it's, so if P equals two, then this is X transpose Y plus one square. This looks similar to the one that we did uh, as a kernel, right? So our kernel was, was this, right? Uh, this is our, was our kernel, except the plus one. Right? But yeah, anyway, still it's polynomial. Uh, there's one other function. Uh, it's called Gaussian kernel or ran radial basis function kernel, which uh, utilizes the Gaussian distribution, the original PDF formula, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, here you see this is a formula. And it, as you can see, that linear kernel considers uh, that the data set is, uh, how to say, linearly separable. So it's gonna be a line. Polynomial kernel, since this is, uh, it is a parabolic shape, definitely you can expect this type of thing. If your data has some samples uh, blended inside uh, your other class, say class positive sample are inside other one, then yeah, polynomial kernel might work better. And if your data has some tendency of grouping, 
so here radial basis function kernel might help uh, a lot. So here, as, as, again, just to refresher that uh, you saw that uh, the original dual problem of the uh, support vector machine, you just replace that. If, if you want to uh, work with support vector, vector machine, if you would like to solve it, you need, you need to first define actually what is the kernel function that you're going to use and you, you replace that at the point where uh, you are doing this guy. Right? Remember the dual problem? This is the part and it works with the original data dimensionality. You need to replace that with higher dimensionality, but higher dimensionality, say phi uh, xi dot phi xj uh, is the same as using one of these kernel, xi and xj, if it, if it uh, is not clear to you. So let me know, okay? so. So we are not working. So if we actually, most of the time we might not be. So if you think, if you're very convenient about your data set that your data is linearly separable, try using uh, the, uh, the simplest kernel, which is the original uh, data dimensionality. But if you are unsure, maybe you're definitely you, you might need to repeat your experiment with choosing different kernels, right? Uh, see actually what which one gives you the best result, right? This is actually we're we're all doing this. I mean uh, we we are comparing uh, different results and see actually which one, where we uh, look good, right? So that is the point, right? So and we we know how to do how to apply the support recognition idea. Um, again, yeah, just motivating you that if the data so here this is a interesting data set, which definitely is not linearly separable, right? So in this particular case, this is a support vector machine with linear kernel, which is this one. So if you uh, do that, this is gonna be performing worse, right? Uh, but in, in this particular case, radial basis function, because it has a tendency to identify groups, it works perfect. And here you see that decision boundary is this, right? The circle, right? And the positive uh, line, and this is the negative line inside, right? So it works phenomenal, right? Uh, and uh, this is a, again a refresher, maybe. So once you know the support vector, uh, I mean, once you know this, definitely you can uh, calculate the sign of that function and uh, predict, right, immediately. So this is just more slide on that. Uh, this is one of the famous problem, uh, maybe Google XOR problem. XOR problem is one of the, how to say it, uh, simpler looking problem that is not linearly separable. Okay, so uh, you, you know about this already. So if you if we plot it, you'll 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 find that this is not linearly separable. So zero zero. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a positive data, right? And say so this is this is plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, right? I mean, uh, in in the support vector machine lingo, uh, so this is uh, zero zero is gonna be plus one, right? Uh, so let's use this. And one 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 is plus, and this is minus, right? And this is minus. You can definitely, no way you can, you can linearly separable, separate that, right? But all the other bitwise operation and or uh, everything are linearly separable. You, you, can, you, you should try that. But anyway, so XO problem became one of the famous uh, data set uh, that is not linearly separable. And you'll see these actually uh, while we're discussing about artificial neural network. This is one of the trivial problem, looks trivial, but it's not trivial because uh, no way you can linearly separate, separate this. But anyway, so if you can introduce, uh, I mean, if you, if you pull the data dimensionality, say that you, if you introduce the third dimensionality to it, x, x1 and x2, this is the multiplication of these two. So these three dimensional data becomes immediately Linearly separable. You should plot it, and you will see that it's astonishing. Okay, 
more examples uh, are like this. Uh, you will see that this data is also not linearly separable. And also question one definitely is for you uh, to find a preliminary decision boundary by looking at the data. And uh, I'm not sure whether this data is linearly separable, but if it is, please uh, find, uh, do visual ins inspections and uh, find the margins uh, calculated actually. And you can run through, I mean, initiate discussion in Canvas uh, and match with your uh, result. Okay. Uh, this is actually piggybacking from this question. So this is a, just an example exercise for you. Uh, so given a data set like this, you have two positive samples here and two negative samples in between. Uh, definitely linear kernel cannot help, right? You can't really, uh, so do not work or does not work. Okay does not work okay uh, so we need to do better uh, this is polynomial kernel that you learned today uh, definitely is gonna uh, change the decision boundary and over oh, and also if you go higher uh, if you go Gaussian kernel is gonna perform even better right uh, so kernel trick in a slide this is one of the best slide that I found uh, from one of the faculties one of the professors, uh, I should have cited that here, but I'll, I'll do it. Probably I did that, uh, but I'll, I'll make sure. But anyway, so, so the, if you are working on the original data dimensionality, uh, this is what we do. So given an input space, I mean, given an original data, uh, so this is what we do. We, we know the e equation, so Wx plus B, and we take the sign, and if it is positive, we predict it as positive. If it is negative, we predict it as negative. And where W is this equation, right? And, and one, one more thing, actually, I, I forgot to mention is uh, the concept of support vectors, right? Uh, let's let's go back a little bit. I mean, uh, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, so here, the dual problem is all about solving the Lagrangian multiplex alpha. Once you know alpha, you can solve your W, you can solve your B, right? Uh, so, and you know that given a data set, uh, not everybody, all the data samples are needed, right? To define your decision boundary because decision boundary is supported by the support vectors. Couple of the data samples, which uh, are in line with the data set, right? I mean, say you have a couple of positive samples here and you have couple of negative samples here, right? Not everybody is, is gonna participate in the defining the decision boundary. So this is the maximum, this is not the maximum margin. So if this is the maximum margin, not, every, not everybody is needed, right? Uh, so you have one here and you have probably this is, this data sample is closest Right, so this is the closest one, and this is the closest one from the Asian boundary. So we call these two as the support vectors, and that's it, right? So, and if you if you see that actually, how to find the support vectors? I miss this. Uh, so this is important. Uh, so we we need to identify the support vectors, and we need to get we can. So the model doesn't need that many uh variables right uh so the, the point uh, that many samples so the support vectors so if it is a say, thousand dimension uh, thousand sample case here thousand case we don't care about the rest right uh once you know that you have only two support vectors that's it uh, your w is simpler in that particular case so how you know that uh, these two are super vectors after you optimize uh, this function, the dual problem of the super optim uh, optimization, you'll see, you'll notice that for these guys, for the support vectors, this will be, will be, uh, it, it will be greater than zero. And this will be greater than zero, okay? So for the support vectors. And for all the data samples, because you have as many alphas as the number of samples in the data set, for 
for this guy, alpha is going to become zero. This guy, alpha is going to become zero. Can you guess what is going to be the alpha for this particular data sample? It's going to be zero, right? So this, that's the interesting property of these optimization. Once you do optimization, uh, most of the alphas is going to be zero. So that's astonishing. So if you have thousands of samples, uh, maybe you have, say, five or six non-zero alpha as a solution. And those non-zero alpha, if you map that with the data set, actually, for which particular alpha it is non-zero, that's definitely part of the support vector. Because that is essentially a support vector. So we can identify a support vector by looking at the solutions of these optimization. That's super cool, isn't it? Uh, so now let's get back. So so that means this is uh, so this is so your W. Since you know that most of the alphas are zero except the support vectors, if you know the support vectors well, this doesn't need to run the entire. I say 1,000 samples, right? I mean, so not the entire n, right? Uh, it can run that many non-zero alphas in. So, uh, so that means computationally it is cheaper. So if you are transforming the data, the original input space into higher dimensional space, so definitely you are now familiar with this, and, and we already saw about this, and this guy can be replaced by the kernel function that you use to solve it. Um, these are actually, again, a monolithic list of kernels you can apply, change, see how your uh, data sample looks like. And also, if, if it helps, uh, apply or try to visualize the data uh, and also uh, the, the results. Okay, so there's, I mean, two Jupyter notebooks that I shared in Canvas. Uh, let me know if you can work on that. So uh, regarding the the solution since this is a quadratic optimization problem so this is actually the primal primal form right the primal form of the uh, support vector machine optimization is this right uh, where, where you need to solve w and b and you know this is a constraint optimization problem because it has two things um, I'm, I keep receiving a message that the internet connection is unstable. Are you guys still on? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. that's fine. Okay, so, okay, good, good, good. So I, I keep receiving that message and it's, it's bothering me for se several times already. But anyway, so, uh, so this is actually a harder problem, I mean, uh, I mean, definitely you will be tempted to solve it using gradient descent, but I suggest you don't go that route. Uh, there is some quadratic programming tool that you can use, quadprog or CV, uh, OPT. Uh, the, 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 there are several libraries that, that solves this uh, quadratic problem very well. Why I'm saying this is quadratic? Because this is a quadratic function, okay? Uh, you can use that. And the quadratic programming libraries are, I mean, are designed to solve quadratic problem in a pretty fine fashion because it's a quadratic programming problem, right? Uh, you have a bunch of variables that you need to solve, right? And it has a bunch of input variables too, right? Uh, so, and these are, you need, to, you need to define as a constraint, right? This is constraint and this is an objective function. So. It needs to. So imagine that you're defining a quadratic programming function uh, that takes input and also provides an output, right? And pro output pro returning output is very simple, right? W and D. But designing uh, a, how to say, a canonical way so that everybody who has a function similar to this can work. So they defined the structure of the input this way. So that means the quadratic programming function that you're going to be using or the library that you're going to be using uh, solves these equation. Okay, so uh, it looks crooked, but it, it will make sense in a little bit. So, so here you see that this is a quadratic programming function because x transpose x, because here you see that your w square 
can be written as W transpose W. I mean, uh, it's also quadratic programming. But anyway, so uh, so that means so it, it solves. So let's focus more on these particular function, which uh, doesn't have any resemblance with the dual problem, dual objective function of the uh, support vector machine. We'll we'll go there a little bit. So a quadratic programming solves these equation. So this is. Uh, the objective function and these are the constraints and here you see that x is the variable that you need to solve right so x transpose x plus f transpose x i'm going to talk about f a little bit so f definitely is a coefficient uh, uh, and these are the couple of constraints so you, you may have some inequality constraint you may have some equality constraints related to this you may have some upper bound you may have some lower bound so you need to characterize that uh, that means you need to transform your original problem. So you need to transform your original problem into 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 this. How? Okay. So let let's still focus on on this one. So this is called the quadratic part, quadratic term. Um, the good thing is we don't have uh, I would say uh, we don't have some inequality or these constraints we don't have. So in the support vector machine optimization, we only have these and we only have that. So that makes our life a little easier. So this is called the quadratic term. You'll see in a bit. Uh, this is called the linear term of the objective function. And these are, you have Q number of inequality constraints, right? So H is if your X transpose, so, is an n-dimensional column vector. So that means x transpose is an n-dimensional row vector, right? So if it is a row, then definitely h needs to be a matrix of n by n. And if x is an n-dimensional column, definitely h, the column dimension should be uh, should be n, right? So you, now you know that data dimensionality of h is a matrix. So we, we now know that. And f is n dimensional. So if you have n or say two linear term, the dimensionality of f is going to be two. Right? It will say, say in a bit. And also a is q by n. If you have q number of inequality constraint, it is a matrix having q rows and n uh, columns. And z is, the is, is a column vector, which is coefficient. But anyway, so now you focus on these particular objective. Uh, let's see an example. Say let's let's work on let's work on this. Uh, okay, so here is a quadratic objective function. These two are quadratic term. Uh, oh, including this one, right? X1 and X2. This is quadratic, right? Okay, and, and these two are linear terms. These are your constraints. So how many constraints do you have? One, two, three, four, five constraints. And so let's design the H matrix, F vector, A matrix, and the Z vector. So, so, your, so your X, if this, is, this is a two variable, uh, two variable uh, problem, right? That means your x that you're solving is two dimensional. So which is x1 and x2. That's we're clear. So the linear term, let's first focus on the linear term. So linear term is minus 2x1 minus 6x2, right? So it can be represented as this, right? These multiplied by this, right? This is an inner product between this variable and this. So so this becomes uh, the f, right? So this is your f. That's it. So your f is a column vector. Uh, now you have, so now you have the quadratic, let, let's work on the quadratic term, right? So you have three quadratic terms. You can, uh, so there is a half in, in front of these. So you take half as a factor and you get these. And you can, you can re redesign it in a way and try to make it as a, uh matrix so you know that you you know uh, so you you know that 
So the optimization routine in the quantity programming library, it takes x transpose h x plus f transpose x, right? So we already found the value for f, right? The, we've already found f. So yeah, you know that we need to match these two, x here, x transpose here and x here. So we, we just need to solve h. Solve means, I mean, we need to fit h in a way so that uh, the result is this, right? Uh, half x1 square plus x2 square minus x1 and x2. And you you will find it astonishing that, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's super simple uh, this way. So uh, you, you can solve alpha, beta, b, and this. So here you see that x1, x, x1, x1, alpha is x squared, right? So alpha becomes, so you can solve these entirely and put alpha, beta, and gamma values in here and you get your h. So this is your h. Uh, and once you know your, so you know your h here, you know this guy and you know f. Now let's focus more on this constraint, how to represent that. So here you see that this is a two variable function. So for each of these variable, you can define a, right? So you take the coefficients one here, the coefficient to x2 is one, right? So this one, if you mul multiply this with uh, say x1 and x2, x1 and x2, you will see that the first quantity is gonna be x1 plus x2, okay? The second quantity is gonna be minus x1 plus two x2 third and fourth and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and your z is gonna be these guys, right? Z is a vector having the right-hand side of the inequality. Uh, remember this, uh, that here, x1 and x2, the constraint was greater or equals. Always make sure that all of them are less or equals. Otherwise, it's not gonna match with this property, right? So you, you just need to change the direction of this, and once you do, definitely you can add these in here as well, right? So now it's super simple. I mean, you just, now you have your H, so this is just an example uh, using the quad prog library. Uh, there's several other libraries, but it has a similar uh, transformation. So you define your H, actually let's solve the problem that we had. So here H, you what, what we derived, F, what we derive, A is the uh, coefficients of the constraint, Z is the right hand side of the constraint, right? the inequality constraint. And you define these matrices and then uh, you, you call the quad probe function. Essentially, quad probe, I do recall this is a function in the MATLAB, MATLAB uh, environment, MATLAB programming environment, not Python. Uh, but in Python, there is also CVX library that uh, I, I provided you. Uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, you can play with that. But anyway, so this is, I mean, they are all working on the almost the same way. So you just call this function with these parameters and done. You, you get your x and you get your optimum value. So this is a minimization problem. Definitely, this is the minimum that you can get. Okay, so, I mean, let's get back to this. I mean, uh, so similarly, you, you do the same to replace uh, your data dimensionality. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be go through with this replacement. Take a look at uh, how this was changed. Uh, so you need to define your H, you need to define your A and uh, the Z. And once you do, definitely you can, you can solve it, okay? So you can, you can all see uh, the Jupyter Notebooks. So the, there are two Jupyter Notebooks that is provided in Canvas. One is the solving the primal form and solving the dual form, okay? So the primal form being uh, super simple. I mean, here you see that, I mean, go, go through these. I mean, it's, it's, it should resonate with your understanding uh, that you learned here. Uh, so in, in primal form, the solving is, uh, I mean, uh, how is it easier and simplistic? But the dual form, as you know that, yeah, the dual form is uh, 
very fascinating in a way that yeah uh, if, if you solve your alpha uh you know which are the support vectors and it's very easy to work with kernels in the dual form not in primal form in the primal form there is no inner product between pairs of samples right that's that's why you have to either transform the data manually and then uh put it in the uh how does it uh, uh, and then you can use the primal form, primal objective function that uh, that I provided already. But in dual form, you can play. I mean, you can have a tons of kernel function. You can define a new kernel as well. And once you do, come uh, here and solve. Okay, so there is uh, optimization routine CV uh, from these libraries, CVX OPT is from the operation research and uh, many people participated in that so quadratic programming is a very well studied research field so you don't need to work uh, diligently on how to optimize that the library is already there so i want you to use that library and uh, so this is a uh, just an example so I've, I've introduced only the hard margin support vector machine soft margin hard, uh, support vector machine is a little bit flexible you can read i'll provide you some documentation and tutorial but anyway so don't stress too much so here you see that you are no stranger to these how to say uh, specifications of these library function okay so meaning uh, that you you need to convert your uh, support vector machines dual form uh, into a way so that you know p you know q you know g you know h you know this equality constraint so Everything is done here. So you, the way that you pass here, you can, uh, there's derivations, you can, it, it's definitely easy to read. Uh, and once you do, you, you, so that means you need to convert that in a, in a way, and then you call this function. That's super simple. You, the, call, the function name is QP, quadratic problem solver, okay? And, uh, and then once you know, so that means it, it, it gets you, the alphas, okay, so alpha, which are the Lagrangian multipliers, right? And once you know your Lagrangian multipliers, you can play. I mean, you can derive W, you can derive uh, the P. These are all these functions, right? And also by looking at the alpha values, one of the alpha, if it is zero, means it's not support vector. You can get rid of it immediately. You, you don't need that. I mean, so that means uh, you, you can reduce the model size. You can shrink the model size significantly, right? So, uh, and also is a soft margin support vector machine uh, allows a data sample within the enemy boundary, right? So that you saw that within that margin, there is not gonna be any data sample, right? I mean, not even positive, not even negative. So, you, but if, if it is harder, so that means it's, it's hard margin, right? So if you allow some of the samples to stay few, I mean, the way that we're making these day, I mean, social distancing, right? So if you allow few, maybe a couple of, I mean, maximum uh, space uh, uh, between, maximum distance between these two uh, data samples, then we call it a soft margin classifier. If we allow these error uh, into the margin, uh, so that's why it's soft margin classifier. So, I mean, uh, it, it's still uh, similar, I mean, but you see the formulation is a little bit different, uh, but anyway, so you can still uh, work on that. So again, uh, you use the library QP to solve the alphas, and once you know your alpha, uh, you, you can calculate your W and B, and using W and B, definitely you can predict, right? Because this, that's all you need. Given a data sample, so you plug W in this equation, WX plus B, and then you calculate the sign. If it is positive, go ahead, predict it as positive. And also this is a, uh, there is a library function in uh, sklearn in Python, and that you can also use uh, just to see actually whether you're doing it right. So there is a comparison that here you see that without using the from scratch, using the quadratic programming library itself, uh, you, you get your W and B this uh, using support vector SVC, uh, the library function, uh, you get to see uh, the W and B, they are the same. So that means you're not doing wrong. Uh, so 